words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Let's be seated. <coughs> So as we uh, introduced the discipleship service um, last Sunday, um, and I said that uh, in these uh, monthly services we're going to be uh, looking at the homilies of the Church of England uh, and uh, thinking about uh, what each of them say. So we had the first homily last week and uh, we're going to think about uh, the second homily today. And the second homily focuses on the question, what does it mean to be human? And as we looked at last week in the first homily, if we want to know uh, answers to questions about God and ourselves and the world, we need to turn to the Bible uh, for those answers. So that's exactly what happens in the second homily. We look uh, to, to, to the Bible for the answer to the question, what does it mean to be human? The Bible answers that question by looking at what we are made of. I wonder if you remember uh, the nursery rhyme, what are little girls made of? Uh, what's the answer? Sugar and spice and all things nice. And what are little boys made of? Slugs and snails and puppy dogs' tails. Well, unsurprisingly, that's not the answer that the Bible gives about what we're made of, um, but it does uh, give a similar damning analysis uh, of what, it's, what that nursery rhyme says little boys are made of, all those horrible things. Uh, the Bible gives a similar uh, damning analysis uh, and a literally damning analysis as well. It takes us back uh, to Genesis, to, back to that formation of humanity where uh, God tells Adam, you are dust and to dust you shall return. The words that we're reminded of in the funeral service uh, with those famous words, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And this isn't just a description uh, of uh, our origins of how we are made, reflecting back uh, into that Genesis story where God takes the earth, uh, formed it uh, into human beings and then breathes his life into it. God isn't just telling Adam something about uh, the way he was made. He's also telling Adam and us something about our nature, about what, it, uh, what we are as human beings, that we are dust and to dust we shall return. We are not eternal beings in that sense, uh, that we are made from dust and we shall return to dust. With uh, the kind of um, uh, insights that science gives us about our origins, particularly when we think about uh, the Big Bang and uh, all of those uh, theories about where life comes from, quite often people will uh, say that we are made of stardust, that that's, uh, even though uh, trying to make uh, something positive out of uh, something that's very random, uh, particularly uh, if there's no God in that picture of the Big Bang and the development uh, of life. Uh, trying to grasp some sort of meaning, some sort of significance. People will say that we are made of stardust, so those uh, brilliant, beautiful things that we see in the sky, that we are like those, a way of trying to get us to think positively about our origins. But God in the Bible tells us not that we are made of stardust, but that we are made of earth dust. Earth dust that is not beautiful uh, and uh, majestic in the night sky, but earth dust that is dirty, that is corrupt, that is frail. That's the nature that we have that God uh, tells us uh, uh, that we have and we hear that uh, in our first reading from Romans where uh, Paul quotes uh, from the Old Testament to say what we are like. It says there is no one who understands, no one who seeks for God, 
all have turned aside and together have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. There was no fear of God before their eyes. As we read uh, those words, uh, Paul says, it's so easy to think about other people and how uh, that is a good description of those uh, other people that we know uh, or that we read about in the news. But Paul is clear, this is what all of us are like. This is what you and I are like. All those descriptions, our throat being an open grave, our mouth is full of bitterness, feet are swift to shed blood. All those are descriptions of us. That is what we are like in our nature because we are earth and dust. Of course, that's not a very pleasant thought. We'd much rather think of ourselves as stardust or perhaps made of sugar and spice and all things nice. But this is the reality that God points us to, that we are made of dust and earth. We're reminded uh, in the first letter of John that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we uh, try to pretend that we are stardust rather than earth dust, if we try to pretend uh, that all those descriptions that Paul makes are not really true of us, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. As we read through the Psalms, the psalmist, com in, in the psalmist constantly confess that their sins are countless in number and even often hidden from uh, ourselves. We should be like the psalmist, confessing that our sins are many and that sometimes we deceive ourselves to say that the sins that we have aren't really sins at all. The psalmist comes to the conclusion that we are sinful even from our conception. And that uh, is the truth that God is pointing us to when he says that we are made of earth. And this realisation of our sinful and corrupt nature has three consequences. Firstly, it means that we can do no good thing without God. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul lists uh, the virtues, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, uh, and the rest of them. But he tells us that they are fruit of the Spirit, they are things that come from God. They are not fruit of humanity. They are not things that we have in and of ourselves. They are things that we can only have uh, with the Spirit within us. Without the Spirit within us, we cannot hope to love, uh, to have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, uh, and all the rest. Paul reminds us that these are the fruit of the Spirit not fruit of humanity. And if we're honest, we know that there are imperfections even in the best of our works, even in those things uh, that we do for other people that might seem to be the most selfless things uh, and altruistic things. We often do them with uh, some uh, kind of sense that we might get something out of it ourselves. Our motives are never completely pure. We always have some sort of selfish motive in the background. But even when we try hard to do uh, what we ought to do, we know that we fail uh, to do it completely. We do not love God as much as we should. We do not love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. And we do not love our neighbours as we should either. Too often we love our neighbours in order to get something back from them or to look good in other people's eyes. We give, forgive, believe, 
live and hope imperfectly. We speak and think and act imperfectly. And this shouldn't surprise us because even as we read through the Bible, even as we look at the great heroes of our faith, we see even in them an acknowledgement of their own failings and weaknesses. Even the greatest of the biblical heroes and saints acknowledge that they are imperfect and that they fail uh, to, to be as they should. And that leads us on to the second thing, uh, the second consequence that we have uh, from uh, being earth, and that is that we have no grounds for pride. Jesus reminds us that no one is good except God alone. No one is good. So we can't pretend that we are good in that way. We can't trust our own righteousness. We can't say to God, look at all the good things that I do. Aren't I a good person? No one is good except God alone. And that's why in our gospel reading, it's a tax collector who goes home justified before God rather than the Pharisee. Luke tells us that Jesus tells this parable uh, to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. The Pharisee prays, thank you that I am not like other people. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector just uh, doesn't even look up to heaven uh, and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It's the tax collector who goes home justified because he acknowledges his failings. It's not the Pharisee who uh, gives the list of his achievements or what he does. Jesus elsewhere in the gospel says that he's a doctor, but he's a doctor for those who are sick, not for those who think that they are well. He is a shepherd who goes out to seek for the lost sheep, the sheep that are utterly lost and can't find their way home. So uh, we see in the Gospels that few of the proud and perfect and holy Pharisees are saved by Jesus because uh, they want to justify themselves by their own counterfeit holiness. They want to pretend that they are holier than they are. They want to look at what they think are their achievements rather than at their shortcomings. They don't come to Jesus because they don't think they need Jesus at all. So as we acknowledge that we ourselves are sinful and corrupt dust and that by ourselves we have no goodness or help or salvation, but instead that we deserve damnation and death everlasting, we see thirdly our need of mercy. We are the sheep that have gone astray and are unable to find our way back. We are those who are sick and unable to make ourselves better. We are those who are unclean and unable to cleanse ourselves. We are imperfect and <coughs> unable to atone for our imperfections. So if we are going to find peace, if we are uh, going to, uh, if we're going to find peace for our guilty consciences, then we need to look outside of ourselves for that. We need to turn to God, who is the Father of mercies and the God of all consolation. He is the one who saves us, not because of anything we do for him, because of course we cannot do anything for him at all, but he saves us only because he loves us. And he saves us through Jesus, the only human who was perfect and sinless. He saves us through Jesus, the doctor who heals us, the shepherd who comes to find us, the saviour who saves all his people from their sins. How Jesus saves us is going to be the topic uh, for the next homily. 
but uh, as we uh, wrap up thinking about what it means to be human, what it is we need to be saved from, we're reminded that uh, to be human is to be dust, to be imperfect, to be utterly sinful and utterly unable to do anything good on our own. So we come to God not with pride, seeking a reward for our own goodness and righteousness, but we come to God with humility, seeking mercy for our sinfulness and, uh, des and our deserving of eternal damnation. And as we come to God in humility, we can also rejoice that He is our merciful, uh, that He is merciful, and that He has already saved us through Jesus, our Doctor, our Shepherd, our Brother, and our Saviour. <laughs>